down. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. And uh, and today we have, we have the pleasure of having our talk on exploring the tail spike protein diversity of a common day phages from theory to practice. And our speaker today is Anders Norgard. So, and uh, just a brief introduction about um, this. He he has been working on the phages for some time and he has he had he did his masters in molecular biology at the University of Aarhus where he where the master thesis focused on the replication complex of RNA bacteriophages key beta. He just finished his PhD at the University of Copenhagen at the phage bio, bio group led by Professor Lone Bronsted. In his in his thesis, Anders has focused on a multiple tail spike proteins expressed by phages in Ackerman Reedy family. In the first part of his thesis, he investigated in silico the tail spike protein diversity of, of Ackerman Reedy phages. The study found out that these phages express a large pool of diverse tail spikes that match with diverse four antigens expressed in Enterobacteriaceae species that the phages uh, uh, recognize. Furthermore, he, the study showed that based on the in silico analysis and experimental results, the host recognition could be predicted uh, of numerous uncharacterized phages. This study entitled Subtypes of Tail Spike Proteins Predict the Host Range of Akamaviridae Phages was published in Computational and Structural Biotechnology Journal. In the second study, the tail spike diversity of Agatra's uh, genus in the, fa in the family was investigated. He recently isolated uh, Agatra virus phage AV101 and used it as an example of an Ag Agtre, uh, Agtre virus phage, where the tail spike protein receptors rec recognition was determined. The receptor binding domains of the tail spike proteins showed similarity towards prophages, therefore suggesting an evolu evolutionary link between lytic and lysogenic uh, phages. Lastly, the knowledge about diversity of tail spike proteins in the family was exploited. Here, the study showed the entire tail spike protein genes can be expressed between phages in the family, thus exchange the receptor recognition evaluated. Anders gave an oral uh, presentation of this study last year in the Viruses of Microbes 2022 conference. Currently, Anders is uh, employed as a postdoc in the same group where he will focus on in the interaction between early expressed genes and the host proteins. The aim is to find phage proteins that can inhibit or kill extended uh, spectrum beta lacta ESBL producing E. coli. Welcome, Anders. Thank you so much. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to give a talk about my thesis. Uh, and as you mentioned, I uh, defended my thesis a month ago. Uh, and this presentation will be more or less the same as uh, what I presented at my defense. So the title of my thesis was Exploring the Tail Spike Protein Diversity of Ackerman V Defages. And today I put the From Theory to Practice on the title. So first, I just want to give a short introduction to what I will cover, a short introduction to the phages and receptor binding proteins and the receptors. And then I will go through these three uh, manuscripts that I put in my thesis. And then lastly, an overall discussion and conclusion. So I don't want to go that much into the bacterial life cycles because I guess many of you know it. I just want to stress that during my thesis, I've been working on the first step, the recognition of the bacteria. So 
if we zoom in on uh, the gram-negative bacterial membrane, which consists of the an inner membrane, a cytoglycan layer, and outer membrane, uh, within this outer membrane, we have uh, different protein complexes that can serve as uh, FH receptors. So we have the flagellum or outer membrane proteins like OMBA and PEBA, or even TOL C. Uh, but also phages can recognize polysaccharides. And here I have uh, highlighted the lipopolysaccharides, which is the receptors for the phages I've been working with. So the LPS uh, consists of the lipid A and core polysaccharides. And then uh, we have the O antigens, which can be highly diverse. And if we look even closer into this O antigens, uh, here you can see some examples from E. coli and salmonella, and you can see that the sugar component can be diverse and the linkage between them can also be very diverse and some can even be branched. So in E. coli, we can find up to more than 185 O antigens and in salmonella, it's 46. Uh, so this was a bit about the receptors for phages, but what about the how these phages recognize the receptors. So we normally talk about the receptor binding proteins as tail fibers or tail spikes. And if we go through the tail fibers first, these are often long trimeric protein complexes that needs a chaperone in order to fold correctly. And they can interact with both polysaccharide and protein receptor. And here I just showed some example of structures of these uh, tail fibers uh, they can be very diverse in their structure. So for instance, T4, the GP37 can be a long uh, stalk structure, whereas the receptor binding domains of protein S from Mu and GP37 of T7 can be more la like globular uh, foldings. But when we talk about tail spike proteins, they often have a very conserved uh, structure, which is this uh, beta helix, as you can see here. Uh, tail spikes are often short trimeric protein complexes that doesn't need a chaperone in order to fold, uh, and they can only interact with the polysaccharide receptors. So one of the phages I've been working with is this S117, which we can maybe use an example to talk a bit about the structure. So we have this head binding domain that uh, is often binding to the uh, base plate of the virin. And then we have this uh, receptor binding domain, uh, which fold as this beta helix. And within this beta helix also, uh, uh, tail spikes often has enzymatic activity. So upon binding to the receptor, they start degrading it. And then in the very end, uh, some tail spike has this intramolecular chaperone domain that aids in the traumatization of the uh, protein. So this was a bit about the receptor binding proteins. And now I would like to introduce you to the uh, Ackerman Vida family as I've been working with. So currently uh, uh, the, it consists of 10 different genera uh, and two subfamilies. Uh, when I started three years ago on my uh, thesis, there was only four different genera, uh, the Octavirus, Limestone virus, Cotter virus, and then the type A virus. Uh, so when I talk about Ackerman Vitae phages from now on, it's mainly these four different genera. Uh, there's not much known about these new uh, gene uh, genera. Uh, yeah. So how does these phages look? Uh, they is described as having a Muviride uh, morphology with a long contractile tail. But what makes these uh, very interesting is that they have this star-like structure protruding the base plate and these are the tail spike proteins. Uh, I will come into them a bit later. Uh, other than that, they have a pretty huge genome ranging from 143 to 164 kilobases. They have a modified genome. So instead of timing, they're using hydroxyl methyl uracil. And this also makes them uh, resistant to some uh, restrictions modification system. Uh, they can infect a broad range of Enterobacteria uh, species. And then, as I mentioned, they can encode up to four tail spike proteins. And when I started, there wasn't much known about the host range of these phages and also which, what tail spike uh, recognize which uh, receptor. 
The only one we knew was this coronavirus CV120, where the O antigens of each tail spikes was known. And common for the one the phages that have been characterized is that they recognize either the LPS or the capsule polysaccharides. Okay, and if we go a bit more into these tail spikes, so within the genomes of the Ackermann Vita phages, these genes are residing in a cluster that is flanked by what was previous called violence associated gene and then a base plate wedge gene. Uh, and if we look even more into how these uh, protein, the protein domains of each tail spikes, they all have this tandem repeat domains. Uh, and these were what I previous called the head binding domain. Uh, furthermore, they have this beta helix, which serve as the receptor binding domain. And then they have a C terminal domain that is probably uh, intramolecular chevron domain. Uh, tail spike two and four has these XD domains. And these XD domains are very important to bind this uh, starlight complex together. And we can go through these interactions. So first, the XD2 domains of tail spike two and four interact together. And then the XD3 domains of tail spike four interacts with the TD1 domain of tail spike one. And tail spike two, the XD3 domains interacts with the tail spike three TD1 domain. So a model have recently been uh, published where they show this uh, interactions. So here you can, for example, see the XD2 domains of tail spike two and four interacting, and then the XD3 domains of tail spike three interacting with tail spike two and tail spike one and four. So this was a little bit about the Ackman Vida phages, but uh, maybe before I move on, uh, I should mention why do we in, why do we study phages and receptor binding proteins? So as many of you know, we have this antibiotic resistant crisis, uh, more and more uh, bacteria getting resistant, but not many new antibiotics has been developed and approved. So therefore phages can serve as an alternative uh, in phage therapy or also uh, biocontrol. Uh, receptor, the knowledge about receptor binding proteins can also be used in other platforms. For example, in pyosins, uh, pyosins are phase-like particles uh, produced by uh, Pseudomonas aginosa. And studies have shown that if you uh, exchange the receptor binding uh, proteins, you can target another bacteria. And this is also something we are doing in the, our lab currently. Uh, it has also been shown that uh, purified tail spikes in themselves uh, can reduce the colonization of uh, salmonella in chickens. So this was more about the applications, uh, why they are important to uh, investigate, but also there is this uh, a co evolution between phages and bacteria. Phages have a strong impact on the evolution of bacteria and also vice versa. We have this uh, complex arms ways between uh, phages and bacteria. So these uh, are also very important to understand. So when I started uh, my PhD, we had these different research questions. Uh, so first, we didn't know much about the tail spike protein diversity in the Ackerman Vitae family. And we didn't know much about the host range and host recognitions of the phages and their tail spikes. And then lastly, it was not known how these phages can adapt to the environment to change new hosts. So these uh, are some of the things I will keep coming back to during this presentation. Uh, so the first uh, paper uh, is called Subtypes of Tail Spike Proteins Predict the Host Range of Ackerman Vitae Phages. And this was yeah. published in a Computational Structural Bio Biotechnology Journal. So here the aim was to in silico investigate the diversity of tail spike proteins in the family and further on use this uh, analysis to predict the host range of uncharacterized phages. And then we wanted to expand and validate these predictions by determining the tail spike recognition of uh, Cotter virus S117, which we had in our phage collection. So on the left, you can see the, uh, the taxonomy of the phages we used in this uh, study and the number of phages in each genera. And on the right, you can see this uh, conserved tail spike gene clusters uh, in different phages, but you can also see that there are already here some diversity. 
So what we did was that we extracted the genomes of uh, 99 Ackermann Vitae phages and uh, located this uh, tail spike gene cluster. Uh, we could find a total amount of 373 tail spikes. <clears throat> we then uh, aligned all tail spike one, two, threes, and fours, and we put them into subtypes if they were more than 75% uh, identical. So we reasoned that if they were more than 75% identical, they may they should uh, bind to the same receptor. So here are the results, <clears throat> and I colored the uh, colored them based on their genera. So in blue we have cotta virus, yellow acta virus, and gray limestone virus, and then in red a uh, type A virus. So first we observed that all these subtypes are associated with the phage genera, meaning that if Octavirus phase and a cotavirus phase do not express similar tail spikes, uh, which was kind of puzzling because we know that some of the phages in the octavirus genus and the cotavirus infects Salmonella and E. coli. You can also see there is a much higher diversity of cotavirus tail spike subtypes, but that's mainly because, or we think it's because that uh, out of the 99 phages analyzed, uh, 69 was uh, from cotavirus phages. Uh, so overall, we found that there were 96 different subtypes and that could suggest 96 different uh, receptors. However, when we not only aligned all tail spike ones, but all of the tail spikes in ones, we could see that for instance, some tail spike ones and fours share similar receptor binding domains, which suggests that they can the receptor bank domain can jump between tail spikes. And we found this a uh, sequence motif, which could be a, re, uh, a location for recombination events. Then we wanted to see, can we, use, uh, can we predict the host range of these uh, subtypes? So we started out by determining the host recognition of S117 that could infect both Salmonella and E. coli. We then cloned and purified these tail spikes and spotted them on their host. Uh, and because the tail spike have this enzymatic activity, then when they bind, they degrade the, the receptor and that will make a translucent zone on the bacterial uh, lawn. So from these results, we could see that tail spike one uh, binds to the O21 antigen on Salmonella, tail spike two binds to the O157 on E. coli, uh, tail spike 3 could bind to both the O4 and O9 on Salmonella typhomirum and intraticities. And we were not able to find the uh, receptor for tail spike 4. We then used this information uh, to predict the host range. Uh, this information also previous published data to predict the host range of um, multiple uncharacterized phages. So for instance, this tail spike 3 in the subtype 1 there's a total amount of 52 phages that express tail spikes in the subtypes. So from that, we can predict that all of these phages recognize these Salmonella, Typhomirum, and Intratitis. And when we go into the literature, we can also validate that some of these is actually binding to uh, infecting these uh, strains. Uh, and we could do this for a number of subtypes, but this there's a lot more subtypes that we don't know the receptor for. So in conclusions in this first uh, paper, uh, which I come back to the research question, we can say that the tail spike, pro there's a huge tail spike uh, protein diversity in the Ackerman uh, Vide uh, family. And this is probably due to match the very diverse O antigens. We also saw that these tail spikes are conserved within phase generous. And what about the host range and host recognitions? Well, now we can say that when we use our in silico analysis and experimental data, we can identify the host recognition of multiple phages. And then what about adaption to the new hosts? Well, because this tail spike gene cluster are so conserved and also the end terminal of all these tail spikes are very conserved, this may promote homolog recombination between the phages. So in conclusions, this study expands the knowledge about the TSP recognition in the family. But maybe we could expand it even more. And this leads me to the second manuscript called Actavirus Phages AV101, recognize four different O antigens of extended spectrum beta lactamase E. coli. 
and this study has not been published yet. So first, a short introduction to these Octavirus phages. They can infect a broad range of Enterobacteria species like Salmonella, E. coli, Shigella, and Enterobacter. However, it's not known about this host recognition. It's poorly understood in these Octavirus phages, uh, also in terms of their genetic diversity. Uh, a previous PhD student has uh, pre uh, isolated AV101 on uh, ESBL producing E. coli, and based on her uh, host range, she could see that it could only infect nine out of 198 tested E. coli strains. But as I was working with these uh, phages, I thought it would be interesting to look further into this phage. So the aim of this study was to elucidate the genetic diversity of these Octavirus phages and determine the host recognition of Octavirus AV101. So we started out by extracting all the genomes from Octavirus uh, phages from NCBI and aligning them. And as you can see, they are very much, uh, uh, they are highly similar in their genomes. There's only a few genes that stands out like homing nucleases and a few nucleotide metabolic uh, genes. Uh, but the highest diversity we see in the tail spike gene clusters. And if we zoom even more into this, a gene cluster. Now I colored them based on tail spike four, three, two, and one. We can see that again, they are very diverse. Only in the end terminal, we see a conservation, which makes sense that because it's important for hinging the star-like complex together. However, we do see there are three phages here who have almost identical tail spike gene clusters. And when we look at how unique these tail spikes are, then we can say that out of these 14 phages, uh, there are 10 different uh, receptor binding domains found in tail spike 2. So this is probably the reason why they can infect this broad range of Enterobacteria species. We then kept on uh, with the AV101 to use an example of this uh, recognition of uh, the tail spikes. So as we did before, we cloned and purified the tail spikes and then spotted them on the bacterial lawn. And we could see that the, there was a, that the, there are a correlation between the tail spikes and the O antigens. So for instance, tail spike one made these translucent zone on the O8 antigen, tail spike two on the O82 antigens and tail spike three on the O153 and tail spike four O159. However, we did see something curious when we spotted tail spike free on these O8 antigens, uh, that they made a very small translucent zone. And I know that this is not easy to see, but maybe here you can see there's a very small translucent zone compared to tail spike one. And when we spot tail spike free on the O153 strain, it's a much, uh, it's a bigger zone of translucent zone. So in order to validate these uh, prediction, uh, these results, we did an uh, inhibition assay. And here we incubate the strains with the tail spikes and let them incubate for 15 minutes. And then we try to infect the strains with the uh, phage. So if the tail spike binds and degrades the receptor, then the phage should not be able to infect. And this is indeed what we see with when tail spike one is incubated with the O8 antigen uh, strain, there's no infections of the phage. And similar with the O82 and tail spike two, we did not see ex an abolishment of infection with tail spike three and four, but we did see a reduction. And maybe this has something to do with the kinetics of the tail spikes. If we prolong the uh, incubation, then maybe we could see a abolishment of infection on these as well. But also we noticed that the tail spike three has no effect on this O8 uh, strain, suggesting that it doesn't, the tail spike three does not bind to O8, but maybe binds loosely to something else, making these small translucent zones. Okay, so uh, we could not find any similarity of these uh, tail spikes within the Octavirus genus, but we thought, what about other phages? So we blasted the tail spikes and we could see that they were similar to uh, E. coli genomes for tail spike one, two, and three, uh, which suggests that they are similar to uh, tail spikes from prophages. And 
for the uh, test bike four, we could see that the receptor uh, uh, that we could see similarity in the towards other lytic phages. And to be sure, to visualize where this uh, similarity was, uh, we predicted the structures using alpha fold. I oh, was not able to do it as a trimer, but only as a monomer. But here you can see in colors where the similarity is, and it's indeed in the receptor binding domain. So this suggests that these tail spikes from prophages may recognize the same as the tail spikes of A101. So in conclusions to this paper, uh, we could say that there is a, also a large diversity of tail spikes in this genus. And we could use this tail spike spot essay to uh, determine the host recognition of the tail spikes uh, of AB101. And we can now say that not only can these receptor binding domains or even or whole genes be swapped among Ackerman V-day phages, but also uh, from uh, prophages or other lytic uh, uh, phages, which makes it even more complex to understand this uh, adaptions to the host, to a new host. So in the last manuscript, uh, which is also not published yet, it was called Exploring the Brand's Receptor Binding Network of Ackerman v phages for Novel Host Recognition. So if we take a step back and look at the gene cluster again. In the first paper, we saw that that they are highly diverse in this, uh, that the tail spikes are highly diverse in the family, but we could also see that, and they were associated with the phase genera. And we suggested that this similar, this very conserved uh, tail spike gene cluster may allow for recombination between the phages. So in this paper, we wanted to mimic the evolution of the tail spike network by the acquisition of new genes in the, without disrupting this functionality of the network. And then we also wanted to see if we could expand this uh, network by adding a fifth tail spike and provide even uh, additional host. And for simplicity, I made a figure of this uh, tail spike complex. And again, I just wanted to stress out that these XD domains are very important to binding this complex together. And I will come back to that a bit later. So the for first thing we wanted to say, uh, to investigate was, can we exchange uh, uh, genes from within this phage genus, the cotavirus genus? So here you can see the genes from tail spike one, two, and three and four from S117 and cotavirus CB120. So they have almost identical uh, test by one and two genes, but there's only N-terminal uh, sequence similarities of test by three and four. But because these domains are so important and they are similar, then we should be able to exchange the whole genes of these test by three and four. So this was basically what we wanted to do using homolog recombination and CRISPR-Cas as a counter selection. We wanted to exchange the whole test by three genes of SP. SPA120 with S117 TSP3. So in the first paper, we determined the recognition of test bike one, two, and three. Uh, with, so, but when we then exchange the tail spike three, the new modified or engineered phage can now infect E. coli O77 instead of this salmonella typomerium O4. And similar when we do do it with the tail spike four. The wild type, we didn't know the, uh, the host recognition of test bike 4, but with this new engineered phage, it can now infect E. coli with the O78 antigen. So it is indeed possible to exchange the tail spikes within these phages, within this genus. Then we wanted to see, can we also do it with phages in the other genera? Our first paper showed that there was no, the, uh, that the tail spike subtypes were only associated with the phage genera. But it should be, we thought it should be able to exchange the genes with other uh, genera as the N terminal sequence are so similar. So, this is what we did with this AV101 from the manuscript 2 and S117. We wanted to exchange tails back 2. And again, when we do the exchange, the tails back 2 now can, the engineered tails back 2 phage can now infect E. coli with an O82. O antigen instead of E. coli with the O157 
So it is indeed possible to exchange the uh, the tail spike genes not only within the uh, cotavirus genus but also with the actavirus genus. So then we thought, can we then expand this network by adding a fifth tail spike? Uh, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to add a fifth tail spike after the tail spike gene cluster, and we thought that if we add a additional XD2 domains to an already GSP2, so it would have two, two XD2 domains, then maybe we could have a complex that looks kind of like this, where the two XD domains of TelSpike 5 interacts with the XD2 domains of TelSpike 2 and 4. So again, uh, we did the homolog recombination, and when I spotted this phage, it could indeed infect the new Salmonella Anatom O3 host. So I was uh, super happy when I saw this, but I thought to be sure, let's uh, uh, do some PCR to ensure that we actually inserted this TELSPAC5 into the genome. And if we look at this first, this is the TELSPAC5 position, and you can see in the wild side and in the modified page, they have exactly the same band which suggests that this test by five has not been inserted into the genome. And furthermore, I was not able to amplify the test by four of this modified page. So to investigate this even further, uh, we sequenced the whole phage. And when we look at the receptor binding domain of test by five with that of test by four in this modified phage, we could see that the receptor binding domain has actually been swapped. So instead of making this formation, the tail spike 4 receptor binding domain has been exchanged with that of tail spike 4. So that was not what we wanted, but this again shows that these receptor binding domains can jump between tail spikes, which is pretty cool. Then I tried again another approach. Instead of using S1017 as a wild type, the wild type one, I used S1017 where the tail spike 4 has already been engineered. So we knew all four hosts when we spotted. And again, we could see that the tail spike 4, 5 uh, could infect the new host, but we could barely see any infection of the host that the tail spike 1 recognized. And even worse, it could not infect the tail spike 2, 3, and 4 host at all. So we sequenced this phage as well. And we did indeed uh, insert the TELSPAC5 gene into, this, uh, into the genome, but this led to a deletion of TELSPAC3 and a truncated version of TELSPAC4. And as I mentioned, TELSPAC4 is important for, the, for binding to the base plate. So without TELSPAC4, there would be no uh, complex at all. And when we look at this truncated version, it only has the domains necessary to make the complex work. So there has, this has been a selection for a phase that works barely. So we think that the complex looks kind of like this with the test bike four with the XD domains necessary to interact with test bike five. And then test bike one can barely uh, interacts with the XD3 domains of TELSPAC5. So in conclusions to this paper, if we go back to the research question two, the host range and host recognition, well, now we can say that we have a potential to construct custom-made phages targeting multiple bacterial hosts based on their O-antigens. Uh, and what about the adaption to a new host? Well, we can say that the whole TELSPAC genes can actually be swapped between phages in the cotavirus genus, but also in the actavirus genus. Uh, we were not successful in creating this fifth tail spikes, but we did observe that the receptor binding domains can jump between tail spikes, which was something that we, uh, we only saw bioinformatically in the other studies. And I should mention that recently a paper has been published about another a phage in the Ackman Vita family, the Taipei virus phage KBS 110, where they actually identified five tail spikes. So if we cannot do it in the lab, then nature finds a way.
So this is pretty cool. So I haven't looked more into this and it's only been bioinformatically suggested that it has five cell spike. It has not been experimental proven, but it's ex exciting. So an overall discussion. So I say that the, the manuscript three was a, we mimic evolution, but if we have to be, it's a very artificial evolution of tail spikes because we do it with homolog recombination with 500 base pair homology arms and also CRISPR-Cas as a counter selection. If we really wanted to see a true tail spike evolution, then it should be a co-infection of two hosts. Uh, and then maybe it needs a lot of passages to see if the receptor buying domains can be exchanged because normally when we see co-evolution, it will be point mutations within the genes and not whole receptor binding domains uh, exchange. But maybe it can, uh, it suggests, we, our study suggests that it should be, it, it's happening, but at what frequency, we don't know. I also didn't show you this, but uh, we also tried to exchange the receptor binding domain from a prophage HK620, and we were not able to succeed. And I also think that uh, if we wanted to show this, we also needed to do uh, evolution experiments with a prophage within the bacterial genome of the phage, uh, when we infect with the phage. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, so, um, so I said that uh, we have now have the potential to make custom-made phages of these Ackermann Vida family, we have the platform for it. So can we use these phages in biocontrol or phage therapy? And there has already been a lot of studies uh, of, uh, uh, from uh, Ackermann Vida phages that has been tested as biocontrol agent uh, in pet food and in uh, tomatoes and lettuce, and they show promising results. However, uh, that has been studies showing that uh, these phages transduce at a high frequency. And we also noticed this in our study. So this is not desirable if we want to use them in phage therapy, because there is a possibility that they can disseminate virulence genes or antibiotic resistant gene. And like, for example, the AV101 phage from manuscript two infects ESBL producing E. coli. So there is a possibility that this phage can transduce these ESBL genes to other bacteria. But can we then use all of this information in other platforms? So the initial idea of my thesis, uh, my project with another postdoc was to make telosins. So make pyrosins out of uh, phages by removing the head. And we succeeded in doing that, but because these uh, phages transduce a lot, there will always be some small percentage of the these uh, uh, telosins that has uh, transduced, so they can make phage particles, uh, and that's not desirable at all. Another way to use these this information is that we are in the group uh, making inner license, which is where you fuse the endolysin with a receptor binding a protein. And through an unknown mechanism, this has a high killing efficiency in gram-negative bacteria. And a postdoc in the group is now working on the tail spike from S117 and trying to fuse it with an endolysin to make these endolysins. Okay, so... Lastly, I just wanted to go through a conclusions about these research questions. So now we, I hope I can uh, convince you that I shown that there's a lot of protein diversity in the family. And this is probably due to the high diversity of receptors found in Enterobacteria species. Also, we have expanded the knowledge about the host range and host uh, and receptor recognitions of the phages and tail spikes. And then lastly, how the phages adapt or exchange the host recognition. I hope that I also have convinced you that because the tail spike gene cluster are so similar, there is a possibility that they can exchange whole genes. Furthermore, we 
saw that the, the receptor binding domains can also be exchanged not only with the Ackman Vida pages, but also other LaTeX pages, as we saw in manuscript two. And then lastly, we also saw that the receptor binding domains can be found on pro pages. So this just makes this uh, receptor binding uh, domains uh, evolution very complex and very interesting to study. And then lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to my supervisor, uh, Lone, Martina, and Cedric, and then also a master student of mine, Dorotje, who helped with the manuscript two and three, and then the whole phage bio group. And then I also went to uh, uh, KU Leuven at Rob Levine's lab uh, to do whole genomic sequencing and also RNA sequencing of the phages. Uh, however, these results have not been analyzed yet. And then thank you all for listening and I will be happy to take some questions if you have. Oh. A nice presentation. Thank it you. It's quite, quite informative. Um, if anyone has a question, please uh, feel free to raise your hands, but there are some questions in the chat. And some of them are, can phages acquire other TSPs in real life? And how often does it occur? Like what is yeah. the... Uh, yeah. yeah, so the uh, we, do, we don't know the frequency of how this uh, exchange happens. Uh, I think that it's a very low frequency that the receptor binding domains can be swapped. And if we t talk about the whole tail spike gene, I think it's so the end terminal of the tail spikes are very important for the binding to the base plate. So you need that part at least to uh, make a infectious particle. So I think it's more, it's, it will be more uh, higher frequencies that is only the receptor binding domains. And this has also not only been shown in Ackman Vida family, but also in many, many other uh, family prophages that these receptor binding domains can be exchanged. Okay. And then to follow up is there's a fear that if it can happen naturally, it might result in changing the phage specificity and may attack the, the beneficial bacteria. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends on, yeah. I, th I really think that it's, it's a, a very low frequency that this is happening. So when we look at, uh, so we only have the, um, uh, these phages that is available on its CBI. As I bet there's a lot of other phages in the Octavirus. So this is just a snapshot of the evolution of phages. So we can only talk about what we see now, but I, I I don't think that it, that it will occur at the high uh, frequency that these uh, receptor binding domains can swap. All right, and Hansada said great presentation and really nice work. And then, can the TSP acquisition be reversed? So that that when we swap them, that they then swap back. Yeah. Or, can be uh, reversed. Yeah, I mean, so we do this very artificial, so we could just make another recombination event where we then swap it back, so that would be easily to do. Okay, and then just a follow-up question on that from Newton is, uh, I guess the outcome of your experiments is to improve on phage therapy. How do you explain the reduction of uh, the phage titer using the customized phages? Do any of your research findings have any public health importance? Yeah, so the first one, so when so when we swap uh, these uh, tail spike genes, then we follow up by propagating on this new host and um, and often the product, so the one the fate the tail spikes I've been swapping, their hosts have often been uh, clinical isolates, and then often we see a lower uh, titer when we do the propagation, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 
uh, but when we compare like the engineered uh, phage with that of the wild type of the phage we have swapped the genes with so let's say the engineered s117 and the cv120 it has similar titer when we propagate on the same host and for the public health importance yeah so when we, so when we started we wanted to uh, uh, we wanted to make these talosins because then there was some beneficial that they that they, I think there is some reluctance to use uh, engineered phages, but maybe because you need to know more or less exactly what there is in the genome. But if we have the pyosins, then we know exactly that it's just just a protein complex. But for now, I don't think that it's far from being used as uh, my findings in public health. Right. And uh, from Benson is that TSPs recognize receptors. Are bacterial receptors also continuously changing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we often see very rapid resistance uh, because the receptors are mutating. But that's, but also, I don't know, I have always thought about this uh, huge diversity of tail spikes and huge diversity of LPS. So I guess that I maybe I think that there's like a arms race here that the phages, if, uh, the tail spike mutates to find the new L uh, O antigen, and then the O antigens also keep mutating to make new O antigens. So maybe that's why there's so much of both Yeah, and then also a comment is, I would like to say congratulations. Your research uh, seems amazing. Performing homologous recombination on something as small as a phage tail spikes with such precision seems like a major accomplishment. I would like to ask, is there a limit on how many tail spikes a phage can carry? And can we theoretically create a phage that contains recognition domains of most clinically relevant uh, significant strains? Or will too many spike proteins reduce the viability of a phage? Yes. So uh, I think it was this year where a study showed a phage that had 13 tail spike expressed on the environment. So using cryo EM and uh, machine learning, they could map out 13 different tail spikes on a single phage. And this is just crazy to think because I would have thought that there would be hysterical hindrances when there are so many tail spikes. But it seems like uh, fate just finds a way to do it. So I think that, and I think this was a Klebsiella phage, and normally Klebsiella uh, has a lot of, uh, the phages infecting Klebsiella uh, is capsule dependent, and there's also a lot of diversity of capsules. So I think each of these 13 tail spikes recognize a different capsule. Uh, so similar to these Ackermann Vide phages. Um, and in terms of if we could uh, make, a, so we could theoretically make a, a phage that target the most uh, clinical uh, strains. So for example, Typhomirum uh, of Salmonella or in E. coli, we see that the O157 that's all often related to the Shiga toxin producing E. coli. So it's just a matter of finding a phage with a tail spike that infect this clinical strain, and then the swapping should be fairly easy to do. Thank you. Um, did you consider including all uh, the phages from uh, JGI databases gene bank has limited number of phages for comparative analysis. Uh, no, I don't. I don't know what the G G JGI database is. Uh, maybe Edward could uh, unmute and maybe explain further. Oh yeah, there is a there's a the database where the novel phages gets to be to be deposited in that databases. So usually when you have a novel phages and you blast against the ACBR, you're going to get limited number of um, phages in there. So the mostly likely your phages that compares 
to your novel phases. The JGI is the one that has a database that has like novel type of phases in there. Okay. Uh, okay, no, so what we did was that we went to NCBI and then we to the taxonomy browser. And then from that, we took all the argument Vitae pages. Uh, so we didn't blast them before we chose which pages to use. But yeah, maybe if this is a large database compared to the GenBank, then maybe there could have been even more interesting findings. All right. Um... Thank you. I'm just wondering when you were making the tail spikes and did you see any uh, deletion of some cryptic genes that phages have and then maybe they're losing some so that they could have others in it? Uh, no, not the, the ones that we engineered. There was no deletion of the only time we noticed this was with this tail spike 5 where the tail spike 3 was deleted and the truncated version of tail spike 4. But other than that, they are identical in all the other genes. All right. Thank you so much, Anders, for your great presentation. Anyone else with the final questions? Thank you so much. And just a reminder that we have two conferences coming up, uh, Viruses of Microbes and the Evergreen. So we should uh, maybe take time and see if we can register. And then for the Evergreen, the bioinformatics uh, workshop will be tried to be availed also online for those people who won't be able to travel uh, to uh, the Evergreen conference. So thank you so much, Anders, and I wish you the best in your postdoc. I'm sure you've just begun. <laughs> yes, uh, thank yes. you again for inviting me. All right, regards to Lorne and tell her thank you for the great work that, you've, that you're all doing on the other side. Thank you, I will do that. All right, thank you everyone and have a good evening or morning for those in different time zones. <laughs>